Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for uh, coming along to our free CL seminar this afternoon. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Roger Barker. Uh, Roger is Director of Corporate Governance and Professional Standards at the Institute of Directors, uh, where his responsibilities include corporate governance, board effectiveness, risk management, company law, and corporate social responsibility. Uh, Dr. Barker, uh, as well as his IOD position, is also Senior Advisor to the Board of ECODAF, the, U the European Confederation of Directors Associations. He's also Chairman of the ECODAI Education Committee. He sits on advisory boards at a number of organisations, including the Institute of Chartered Accountants, uh, and he's a visiting lecturer at a number of institutions, including C Business School at Oxford, ESEC in Paris, UCL and the Ministry of Defence. Uh, Dr. Barker has authored a couple of books, uh, influential books on corporate governance. Uh, corporate Governance, Competition and Political Parties, Explaining Corporate Governance Change in Europe, was published by OUP in 2010. Roger is also the co-author with Dr. Neville Bain of the IOD's main guide to the role of the board, the effective board, building individual and board success. Uh, in his past life, uh, Dr. Barker was an investment banker uh, in London and Zurich. Uh, he's also uh, a doctorate. Uh, he has a PhD in corporate governance from Oxford. Uh, and he's also previously been a lecturer at Merton College. And I only recently found out he's uh, also a Cambridge alumnus as well, uh, a former Corpus Christi person. Uh, I didn't know uh, prior to inviting Roger uh, to this event that he actually had Cambridge as well as an Oxford history, which he was delighted to hear about. He also has degrees from Southampton and Cardiff as well. And Roger's here to speak about one of the most topical issues in uh, certainly in corporate governance uh, and uh, in uh, commercial and financial law and practice more generally, which is financial market short termism and corporate short termism. Hence the title of Roger's talk this afternoon, Short Termism in UK Public Companies, Implications, Evidence and Policy Options. So without further ado, I will pass the floor over to Roger. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. I, I didn't realise I was that old, actually, as, as you were going through that list of things. I mean, you know, I'm only a young chap still. Um, yes, well, it's great to see you here today to talk about this topic. And... I want, you're probably thinking, what on earth has a marshmallow got to do with the issue of, of, of short-termism? Well, you may have heard of this experiment which took place at Stanford University in the late 60s, early 70s, where kids were given the opportunity to delay their gratification in terms of eating marshmallows um, and then be given additional marshmallows or to just you know, go for it, immediately gratify their desires and eat the marshmallow. And in a way... Uh, uh, what was interesting actually about this particular experiment was that those kids that were able to delay their gratification in subsequent years actually had much more successful outcomes in terms of their careers, in terms of their relationships, in terms of their earning power. So it seemed that there was a relationship, some kind of relationship at the individual level between your ability to take a long-term view and delay gratification of, of, of needs and desires and success and that really, I think, is analogous to the debate that we are going to talk about today, which relates to the, the possible short-termism, um, or otherwise, of UK public companies, um, UK companies quoted on stock markets. Is there something about that kind of um, organisational model which inherently pushes companies towards a short-termism, which in some way could be detrimental to their, to their long-term success and to the success, actually, of the UK economy as a whole. I mean, this, this is not a new argument. I mean, it really goes back, you know, to, to Max Weber, if there are any, any budding sociologists out there who, who, who actually try to explain um, economic performance in terms of the ability to delay gratification. Um, so it's a very long, uh, a long um, um, standing argument, and it continues to be controversial. And what I want to do today is just really to take you through some of the evidence. Some of the evidence I'm going to present is academic, are academic studies. Some is more anecdotal evidence, a couple of case studies, some survey evidence. I mean, I wish that I could, uh, you know, provide a, the definitive answer to this whole topic in, in the course of the next hour. But 
I can't. Um, what I'm going to present to you is, is to some extent, a partial snapshot. And ultimately, I think, you know, you have to make your own mind up um, as to whether short-termism genuinely is a problem in UK public companies, whether something needs to be done about it, whether it has serious implications for the UK economy or not. So why, let me just start by asking why should short-termism in UK public companies matter? Well, in theory, if you're short-term oriented and you're, you are really wanting to extract the maximum of return, and that you're really wanting to make your assets sweat, get the greatest short-term return out of your, your company, um, that is going to have implications for the way you operate your company. You are possibly not going to be very inclined to invest in a lot of research and development, which is something which could only pay off in the very long term, very uncertain. You, you may be very skeptical and cautious about investing in new products, entering new markets, or, or developing or applying new technologies. Um, you may be also very cautious about recruiting new staff. You know, uh, why add to your overhead when that could have very negative implications? Um, it also, I think, can, can affect the attitudes that your staff have for you as an organization. I mean, in the um, so-called varieties of capitalism literature um, associated with Hall and Soskis, there's a lot of talk about how when companies are prepared to take a long-term perspective, the staff the human capital of companies is much more inclined to, to invest in specific skills which are relevant only to that specific company. And because they're willing to do that, that ultimately potentially can enhance the productivity and the success of, of, of the company. So the overall argument as to why short-termism matters is that it can lead to this range potentially, of adverse uh, behaviour on behalf of organisations, which ultimately is going to stand in the way of economic success of the company and of, of the economy. Now, what evidence actually is out there to, to suggest that short-termism is actually a problem? You know, maybe, maybe it isn't a problem. Well, let me start here just with a survey that the IOD uh, undertook a few years back. Um, we surveyed a number of different groups. We surveyed our own members that are somewhat oriented towards the directors of, of smaller companies, um, unlisted companies. We um, surveyed some business leaders who were board members of major listed companies. Intellect members were, were academics. Um, TUC representatives were people from the trade unions and we asked them do you believe that short-termism is a problem in the UK economy where with with our companies in the UK economy and as you can see there there was some spread of of views um, but surprisingly actually most of these stakeholder groups did think that it was either a major issue or a significant issue so there was a perception from these these different groups of stakeholders that, that is something that was worthy of concern. I mean, another, th another um, type of statistic which is often adduced in respect of this debate, and this is, this is something which was presented in the Kay Review, um, a report uh, published by Professor John Kay a couple of years ago when he examined the issue of, of short-termism in equity markets, um, was the fact that the UK in particular uh, seems to spend, in, amongst its private sector companies, a relatively small amount relative to other countries on research and development, particularly compared to countries like Germany and Japan. So again, this is the sort of statistic which has been adduced to suggest, well, is there something about the nature of UK public companies which makes them averse to investing in long-term research and development activity? Another report which looked at this topic, uh, which was produced by Sir George Cox a couple of years ago. Sir George Cox is a former Director General um, of the IOD. Um, a particular, gave this particular example of how the UK has a tendency to be very good, actually, in basic scientific research, 
uh, particularly at the university level, but then is relatively poor in developing you know, that research into commercially applicable and successful outcomes. And the example which he gave in, in this report was that of a new material called graphene, which has been developed at Manchester University um, about 10 years ago, um, which won them the Nobel Prize and appears to have a tremendous range of poten potential applications. It's a very flexible, thin, um, high conductivity material, which has all sorts of um, potential applications in mobile phones, solar cells, and, and, a, and a range of other uh, applications. And what he quoted in his report were the number of patents that had been filed in respect of graphene um, from different countries and different types of organization. And it was very striking how, for example, Chinese companies appeared really to see the, the potential of this new material and had filed literally thousands of patents, uh, whereas UK companies, the, the country where this material had been de uh, developed, UK companies, only 54 uh, patents. Um, Samsung alone had filed more patents than the UK as a whole. So again, this, this for, for Sir George Cox, this added to the impression that somehow the UK, because of the short-term orientation of its public companies, was, re was somehow reluctant to invest in this sort of long-term uh, research and development activity. Let me provide you here with some studies, some more academic studies, which have been conducted on this topic. I won't go into them in, in a huge amount of detail. Uh, the first one, King, is actually Mervyn King, um, the former governor of the Bank of England, who earlier on in his career did a lot of research into this topic um, and, and concluded from his research uh, that the sort of discount rates which were, were being used by UK corporate entities in order, in order to assess investment decisions was incredibly high, which to him was indicative of a pretty sort of short-term perspective in terms of investment activity. There have been various other surveys which have been undertaken by, by professional services firms which have asked managers the sort of questions like, you know, if it was a choice between investing in a, pro a project which was going to generate a lot of value or alternatively, not investing in those those projects, but using earnings to smooth the earnings profile of your company so that your shorter term earnings look more favourable. Which of those would would you would you choose? And the sort of results which have come out of these surveys is that yes, corporate managers do seem very willing to actually favour this sort of short-term earning smoothing type activity, even if it's going to be at the expense of long-term value creation. And final study there, Haldane, Andy Haldane is currently the, the chief economist at the Bank of England. He's done a lot of, a lot of research on this. And he, when he looked at the valuation of the UK and US equity markets, the sort of implicit discount rates which he calculated uh, from the valuations of those markets to him also implied that there was a kind of short-term perspective on behalf of investors in terms of valuing um, equity markets. Now I will, there's just one study which I think is of particular note which was published about a year and a half, a couple of years ago which I think, by John Asker and his, and his co-authors, which I think is a particularly interesting study, um, because it is, it's very well designed, and it's trying to actually look at the investment behaviour of public companies versus private companies. And it's quite a sophisticated piece of work, because it tries to very much compare like with like. So it looks at companies that are equivalent in terms of the sector, their sector operation, their size. The only difference between them is that one is listed and one is a privately held company. And it looks at thousands of companies um, across the US in, in these terms and finds that the private companies, relative to their peers in the listed sector, appear to invest, have much higher rates of investment 
Um, and this is particularly the case, actually, where investment opportunities arise, that private companies are much faster to actually to, to respond uh, to these investment opportunities by increasing investment. And, and this is a, he finds this to be a particular issue in comparison with public companies that have very sensitive share prices relative to earnings news um, in the stock market. So for him, the conclusion of this is that there is something about being a listed company with your shares quoted on the stock market, with your shares actually actually fluctuating um, in response to changes in short-term changes in investor sentiment that really places short-term pressures on you and that makes you, for example, much, much less likely to invest in long-term uncertain uh, benefits. Now... Let me now just move away from, from, from you know, the, the academic studies to just a bit of a case study here. And that, that's a, a very recent uh, pro problem that we've had in the UK with Tesco, um, our biggest supermarket. I mean, this monolithic entity, which I think has at its peak had about a third of the UK food retailing uh, market, was embroiled last summer in an accounting scandal um, it turned out that actually it had overstated its earnings by about £260 million uh, in the first half of last year. Um, and effectively what it had done is it, it, it had shifted revenues from the future into that accounting period in, all, in order to flatter um, its earnings picture. And that you know, there's been a lot of controversy over this. Uh, the CEO of the company um, resigned, although he actually it actually came to light a few weeks after a new CEO had taken over. But there's been a lot of turmoil at the company. And what seems to have happened is that Tesco appears to have had some pretty bad relationships with its suppliers. And there have been various commercial relationships in place between Tesco and its suppliers. Tesco appears to be in a, have been in a position, like other food retailers, to exert a lot of pressure on its suppliers, uh, you know, to, to move backwards and forwards the revenues that, that, that arise from its commercial relationships uh, with suppliers. Um, the, the, the new CEO of Tesco um, has said, look, this was, this was a disaster. Um, it's not going to happen again. We were under a lot of pressure. Um, you know, we're facing a lot of competitive pressure from discounters like Aldi and Lidl, who are really coming into the market and challenging our position. And that what what seems to have happened is that managers were, were in, in in Tesco felt under pressure from investors, from financial markets to to come up with the goods to put, to keep their earnings at at a um, at a high level. And as a result of that, they succumbed to the temptation of trying to manage their earnings stream uh, and boost their earnings in the short term, even if that ultimately is not something which can be sustained over the long term. So this is this appears to be a, to be a case where market pressure is really affecting management <coughs> behaviour. There are various other uh, points, shall we say circumstantial evidence, which I just want to very briefly point out to you, um, which although perhaps not direct evidence of, of short-termism, do make, do give one pause for thought um, and do demand um, an explanation. And the first one, thing that I would point to is that we are currently living in a world where, where large corporations have huge cash piles. And for some reason, even though we're living in a world of record low interest rates and there's been unprecedented monetary stimulus in the global economy, corporates are not investing. Um, they're sitting on huge piles of cash. Why, why, why is that happening? Well, there are various explanations for that. I mean, there are explanations in terms of ta taxation. Uh, you know, a lot of US companies have big piles of cash outside the US, which they don't want to bring back into the US but, but because they'll be penalized by the inter Internal Revenue uh, Service. But personally, I'm, I'm not hugely convinced by that argument. I mean, there was, a, there was an amnesty um, about 10 years ago, which allowed a lot of US companies to, to bring back their cash piles. And what, what did they do with the money? Well, they tended to spend it on share buybacks uh, rather than actually invest it. And this bring, actually brings me to the next, the next point, 
it is actually um, amazing the level of share buybacks which are going on amongst large companies at the current time. And it especially amazing actually when you think it wasn't that long ago when buying back your shares was, was illegal. Um, and I think even as late as 1998 in Germany, it wasn't allowed to buy back your own shares. But yet now share buybacks have, have conquered the world. And it's the mantra almost of any self-respecting management, particularly in the US, but also in the UK, or any activist shareholder, buy back your shares. But what what is that actually achieving? Um, there are good... One of the, I think, problems with a lot of these things is that there are, of course, good reasons to buy back your shares. You know, if you haven't got any compelling investment opportunities, rather than waste the money, by all means, uh, you know, return the share, share, the money to shareholders. But have, have management really run out of ideas? I mean, have they really, are they really unable to identify uh, the sort of business opportunities and, and possibilities for value generation to the extent that the, these cash piles and these sharebacks uh, imply. Um, it, it, to me, it's a, it's a very um, unsettling type, type of activity. Another th- p- uh, statistic I would point you to, or p- work that I would point you, you to, is the work which has been undertaken by the OECD, who have actually... Um, found that public equity markets on a global basis over the last decade or so have not actually raised any net capital for companies. So the capital which has been raised in the form of IPOs and and, and secondary equity issuance has been more than matched by share buybacks um, and other types of activity which which actually reduce the amount of equity in circulation. Um, So what, what is it meant to be the big advantage of the public company vis-a-vis the private company is that you know, it's, a, it's a vehicle which is better placed to raise capital. And that is what stock markets ultimately are primarily there to do, uh, to, to provide a vehicle for capital raising, which can be then applied in the economy to generate growth, innovation, and so on. Um, but equity markets don't appear to be doing that. And that's to me, is a worrying sign. Why, why, why are equity markets not actually fulfilling um, their, their true purpose? Why are equity markets just being used as a kind of vehicle of secondary trading to kind of recycle funds from companies back to shareholders, back to companies, of course, with all manner of financial intermediary uh, sitting in between the, these flows and taking their cut of, 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 the, of, the, of the funds? Another um, piece of circumstantial evidence which worries me is actually the behavior of U.S. technology companies, which have been listing on the U.S. equity market in recent years. Companies like Facebook, Google, um, Amazon, um, and so on. And you probably observe that they have been adopting very um, sharehold, minority shareholder unfriendly type government structures. They've effectively been, been designing a governance, governance structure which insulates either the founders or the management from financial market pressure, either by issuing non-voting shares or having uh, multiple share classes. Um, th- and the rationale for these mechanisms, the, the, the rationale which is, is put forward uh, by Jack Ma or Jeff Bezos, or whoever it might be, is you know, we can't run a technology company if we are subject to the constant buffeting and short-term demands of financial markets. You know, we need stability in order to make the long-term investments which are going to turn us into a successful technology company. Um, and so they come, so they come to the market with, you know, with these structures. Um, and inv- institutional investors have complained and sort of griped about it. But ultimately, these are the the amazing companies of our of our age, and you know they've still invested. And something similar was a similar type of point was made recently, just within the last couple of weeks, where it was reported that a lot of late-stage U.S. technology companies were actually not 
um, listing on stock markets. They were preferring to actually remain closely held companies because on the one hand, there, there, there appears to be ample sources of financing available to them from venture capitalists and the like. And much better to stay private if they can get that sort of funding than expose yourself to financial markets by becoming public. Um, of course, it's a risky thing for investors because they, these companies are not going through the same due diligence that, you would, that they would go through, for example, by the SEC if they, if they were listing. But again, it, to me, this is a worrying sign that a lot of the really entrepreneurial dynamic companies out there see public the public equity markets as something which isn't actually going to be helpful for their development. Um, so a source of concern. And here is the man himself, Jack Ma, who actually made what I thought was quite an amazing uh, statement just pr prior to the, f the flotation of Alibaba in New York last year, the, the world's largest ever IPO, you know, blatantly said, look, we put customers first, employees second, and shareholders third. You know, we are running this company, we're not running this company for shareholders, uh, which is a, a, if you think about it, an amazing thing to say, just immediately prior to launching an, an IPO. But he, you know, he, th th that was what he, he believed. And someone like Jeff Bezos, I think, would, would say exactly the same thing. Now, what, what are the causes of short-termism? Um, if, if you accept my argument that there is short-termism in, in public companies, and I don't want to suggest that I've presented a definitive proof of that, but I think that there are strands of evidence out there which, which give one cause for concern. What, what, what are the, if, if you buy that argument, what are the potential causes of short-termism? Well, certainly the survey that we did did point the finger at, at shareholder pressure. So it's very much an issue for public stock market quoted companies. And I think really the argument here is that is, is in two parts. The first part is that financial, financial markets on which listed companies are trading are themselves pretty short term in terms of their fluctuations and in terms of their sentiment. I mean, you know, I, I put there that 70% of stock market turnover is by traders rather than longer term investors. You know, the average holding uh, period of an equity investor in the UK, pretty short, about eight, eight months, has come down hugely over the last couple of decades. But so financial markets are relatively volatile. But on the other hand, one could equally say, well, just because financial markets are short-termist and, and are relatively volatile, that doesn't necessarily mean that companies themselves um, are, have to be short-termist. There has to actually be a transmission mechanism from the short-termism of financial markets to company behavior. And I think that the, the, transmission, me the transmission mechanisms which are generally put forward um, are first of all the type of executive pay arrangements that, that exist in, in major UK companies um, and also US companies, which are, the, are, in, are often designed to align the interests of senior management and the CEO with shareholders. They're, they're kind of a response to the principal agent problem you know, in, in corporate governance. So they are trying to get managers thinking and behaving like like investors, like shareholders. A second uh, transmission mechanism is, is the threat of hostile takeover, which I would suggest is very very specific to the UK because you, the UK is, is quite distinctive in having a very open market for corporate control in contrast to, say, continental Europe or the United States where you know, poison pills are, are very prevalence. Um, so, you know, the threat of hostile takeover, your share price goes down too far, suddenly you become vulnerable uh, to a takeover from another organization that potentially can put pressure on you to, to uh, think short term. And then a, a growing um, uh, so, source of, of short termism, I would argue, are activist shareholders that are becoming incredibly important in the United States. Less important um, in the elsewhere in the UK, uh, for example, and, and beyond. Although it's interesting to see uh, what's happening currently in Japan, where activist shareholders are 
you know, trying for the first time, time to put pressure on certain uh, Japanese companies like Sony, for example, and others. Um, but certainly in the United States, there's a huge amount of money within hedge funds, which is out there pursuing an event-driven um, activist strategy. And typically the demands of these hedge funds are, you know, break up the company, buy back your own shares, um, undertake a takeover. Or, or allow us to sit on the board so that we can actually push that through ourselves. It's very much event driven. And of course, you know, the, the, these hedge funds are not homogeneous. The men, they have many different strategies. Some are more long term than others. But in a lot of cases, it is about, I would argue, it is about getting that pop in the share price uh, through this kind of strategy, which then enables you then to sell out at a profit. You know, it's, it's quite a straightforward strategy. Um, the, the, the difficulty, I suppose, with these transmission mechanisms is that one can actually see them all in a positive light, you know, you, rather than negative light. The threat of hostile takeover, it could be seen as a source of discipline for companies, uh, rather than the source of short-termism. Activist shareholders could be seen as, again, a source of discipline to, to shake up companies, to make them do the, the right thing, to think about uh, not their own personal interests, but the interests of, of shareholders. So that is, I think, you know, that's where the, the debate is so, is so difficult, uh, just depending on how you see, actually, the influence of these type of actors and these mechanisms, either in a positive light or as a force for short-termism. Now, I'm just briefly going to run through some potential policy options, um, which if one thought short-termism in public companies w uh, was a problem, the sort of things that one could consider. Um, some, I think, are more credible than others, um, but I just wanted to give you a range of options as, you know, to inform your thinking. I mean, perhaps the most sort of benign and light touch way of trying to deal with this is through the introduction of the stewardship code which has been introduced by the financial reporting council here in the uk which is really a way to cajole and persuade institutional investors to take a longer term approach to their investments to be good stewards um, to, to not just be traders of shares buying and selling but to to be be there as as longer term governance actors and that and there's a related there's a related uh, initiative something called the investor forum which is something which arose from the k review which is trying to also uh, coordinate institutional investors uh, to get them to work together actually to exert a more positive influence over companies over the longer term i have to say my own view of that is i don't i don't see much evidence that that has fundamentally changed um, investor behavior a lot of fund managers and asset owners have signed up to the stewardship code uh, in principle. Has it actually be uh, changed behavior? I'm not so sure. I was just yesterday uh, had a meeting with uh, the head of governance at Standard Life, one of the big, big UK institutional investors, and he is very pessimistic about the impact that that has had. You could try to um, nudge, incentivize, or cajole institutional investors to behave in a more long-term manner in terms of their investment philosophy by, for example, using uh, the tax system. Um, you, know, you could, for example, imagine a more favorable rate of capital gains tax for people who hold shares for a longer period of time. I, you know, the, the problem with that, of course, is that you know the majority of people who own UK equities nowadays are based outside the UK. They're not UK investors. Uh, and a lot of the institutions have their own pretty favourable tax arrangements anyway. So I'm not sure how that is going to have a big impact. Ensure that long-term shareholders only vote on takeovers. So something which I, which I understand is going to go into the Labour Party's manifesto just ahead of the general election is a proposal that... Um, if you have joined the shareholder register during the course of, of a takeover bid, you won't actually get a, a vote on the takeover. Um, so this is an eff effort to say, well, it's only longer term shareholders who will actually have the say um, in a takeover. This was something that was a 
very controversial issue in uh, Kraft's takeover of Cadbury a few years ago when the, the board of Cadbury, Sir Roger Carr, the chairman of Cadbury, said, look, ultimately the people who are making the final decision here are just a bunch of, tech, of hedge funds who bought in um, during the course of the takeover process. Encur encourage another, another, pos another po policy approach. Encourage separate classes of shares with different voting rights. My view is that there's nothing intellectually wrong with that. I personally don't have um, a great adherence to the, the, the kind of one share, one vote mantra. But one has to recognise that institutional investors in the UK are completely against uh, different classes of, of shares. Uh, they, they see that as unfair. Um, it's, they want to have you know, the maximum flexibility and the maximum power. So I think the problem that any company has in getting, is getting investors to accept that. And at the end of the day, what investors, what companies tend to care about is are they going to be able to raise the funds that they need to, uh, from the market? And if, if there is this huge barrier in the way, that, that is something which deters them. Encourage companies to grant preferential dividends or enhance voting rights to longer term shareholders. Well, we, we just, we just had an interesting case study of this actually within the last few weeks when the Italian government um, tried to make it, e or put forward a proposal to make it easier for companies to actually allow um, shareholders who were longer term shareholders, longer than two years, to have a greater voting power in the company. The result was a whole group of institutional investors wrote a letter to the Italian government and the, Prime Min the Italian Prime Minister, Matteo Renzi, literally after a couple of days, um, did a U-turn did a and said, we don't want to put any, anything in the way of foreign investment into Italy, um, so we're not going to do this. Um, the French have done, have done this There's something since 2012. Um, something along the, these lines has been in place. Um, but it is, it's, it's not popular with institutional investors. Um, I'm just going to step over that. Implement a Tobin tax. I mean, if you feel that uh, financial markets are too volatile, too focused on trading rather than ownership, why not introduce some kind of tax on the trading of shares? This is something that um, a number of countries in the European Union, led by France, still want to do. Um, but it's something which the UK in particular is very much uh, against. Luxembourg as well, because they see it as a, as a threat to the, um, the financial market activity that takes place in their respective countries. It's, so whether that is something that will, 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 will come to pass is, is difficult to say, although of course we've had stamp duty in the UK for about a century, which is with effectively um, a Tobin tax, a financial transaction tax. That doesn't appear to have affected um, our financial markets too much. Another proposal, abolish short-term reporting, um, abolish quarterly reporting of companies. The argument there, which was made in the K review, is that if companies are reporting on a very short-term basis, that encourages a sort of short-termist mentality, both amongst investors and the companies themselves. That, that proposal is actually being acted on. And in fact, in November of last year, across the EU, it no longer became mandatory to report on a quarterly basis. It is now up to the company to decide, do they want to report on a quarterly basis? A few Europe, uh, UK companies have already decided uh, that they're no longer going to report on a quarterly basis. National Grid, um, United Utilities, for example, they both, they both announced that. Other companies, I, I would have thought, are, are likely to follow. But to me, that is a, I think, is a sensible approach allow the company itself to decide, does it want to report on a quarterly basis? Does it, is that what is demanded, what is relevant for its particular business model and it is its investor base? Encourage longer term remuneration arrangements for executives and, and non-executives. Uh, you know, that, I think it's a, I mean, that's a huge issue, a very top, uh, horny, uh, highly political issue and we're, we're just going now this week into the reporting season for the major banks we had HSBC reporting yesterday, and pay is going to be very, very controversial. Um, 
the, of course, the big part of most executives' remuneration at the current time is not their basic salary or their bonus. It's actually their long-term and so-called long-term incentive plans, LTIPs, which are you know are generally um, is generally a, a package of variable pay, which um, executives receive when they achieve certain performance goals. Um, the problem I have with them at the moment is that typically th this performance horizon is three years, which doesn't sound to me like a very long-term performance horizon, despite the fact they're called long-term incentive plans. It's hardly long-term. So, so I think what we need to do is actually make them more genuinely um, long-term. And the other thing, the way in which they're criticised, is that they tend to actually focus performance on things like um, earnings per share growth and total shareholder return, which are things which fluctuate in, you know, on a short-term basis. And a lot of people would like to see performance criteria which are much more tied to the, the long-term strategy of the organisation. But of course, you know, the, these are thorny issues. If there were easy answers to, the, to these issues, then they would have, they would have been um, undertaken already. We could, of course, allow poison pills, as, as is undertaken in, in the US. That is something which would be, I think, anathema um, here in the UK. Um, the, really, the whole framework of, of take, takeover regulation um, in the UK has been developed to really um, ensure that minority shareholders get a fair deal. And poison pills are seen as something... I think, which entrenches uh, management and, and entrenches boards. But I suppose, you know, there are, there are, as with, in these, uh, with these other uh, topics, there are two ways of looking at poison pills. Either they're something which entrenches management um, and boards, or they're something which allow you to take a long-term business approach. And which side of that argument you come down on, well, you know, there are... It's not clear who, who is actually right. Um, and then a final point I would make here is that one could actually get the government involved in determining takeovers and, it, and extend the current public interest test um, for takeovers. I mean, there are certain areas where the government is currently entitled to, to intervene in a, in, a, in a takeover situation and potentially block the takeover. That could be... That could be um, extended. Um, that's something that, that we at the IOD are not tend not to like the idea of um, because we, we can easily see that the whole takeover process can become highly politicised. Uh, you know, you can imagine a situation where a particular group of affected stakeholders from a takeover starts to lobby hard in the media and with government. Um, and then that then leads to decisions about uh, takeovers being taken on, on on political grounds. But but it's certainly one way in which one could address the issue. So that those I think are a range of, of policy options which one could use to address this issue of short termism. But for me, I think you know the the whole problem would probably go away and would probably be solved if we had more investors like Mr. Buffett here, who, who proclaims that his favourite holding period um, is forever. You know, if we had patient capital, if we had investors that were prepared to sit it out for the long term and convey that to, to boards and to management, that probably would be the, the ideal solution. So really what I'm, what I'm saying is somehow, can we get to a situation where we have the best of the worlds of a private company with a long-term, potentially long-term horizon and a public company where there is this great potential to raise capital for future growth? That to me is the challenge of this debate. Can we blend together these two worlds in the best possible way? Thank you very much.